Jim Norton is not a doctor. He's not an expert. He's not even a good person. The views, opinions, advice, and humor of Jim Norton does not reflect those of any doctor, of Sirius XM, of OB Radio, or anyone else. They are solely those of Jim Norton, Lyle Chipperson, Edgar Mellencamp, Paul Hargis, and whoever else lives in that chinless head of his. If any of this advice goes wrong, you are the asshole who called a comedian instead of a doctor. An icon in comedy, a fighter for freedoms, an accomplished entertainer, and a pervert. You've got problems, he's got problems. You've got questions, he's got answers, some of which are good. Call now, 866-WOW-1WOW. That's 866-969-1969. This This is The Jim Norton Show. Ah, I didn't know if I was going to make it today. I was um, not feeling that great. And I had to go and do something because people know that I'm moving. And, um, you know, I had to meet the person who has helped me fix the apartment. Um, You know, I bought it from people who rented it, you know, and they just left it in shit condition. And what a nightmare the city is today with the fucking traffic. Oh, my God. It took me almost an hour to go 50 blocks. I was homicidal. And uh, then I had to go to the pharmacy to get some allergy medication, and that was just a nightmare. So whatever. I'm alive and I should shut up, but I'm, uh, you know, just a little frustrated and frazzled. Hi, Rob. You have a question about religion from this morning. Hello. Hey, Jimmy. How you doing, buddy? Hey, man. Um, my question was, it's kind of hard. Let's see. Uh, Lynn, you can have similar views on religion. I, I've got my doubts for sure. You know, and uh, I just wonder, how do you know you're making the right decision? You know, you kind of want to hedge your bets. A lot of it doesn't make sense to me. There's people that buy into it completely. I live in the Bible Belt down here in the South. But I will be that way. But I just I have so many doubts about it, I kind of can't be. You know, it's one of those things where some somebody once said, at the end of the, like, at the, when you die, if you believe in God, if you're wrong, what have you lost? But if you don't believe in God and you die, well, then, you know. But I, I don't know. I, I'm up in the air on it. Um, I, I just don't know. But, you know, hedging your bets, it's all you can do. It's what belief system you buy into, really. There's no way to say. Cause if there was a way to edge out which one's right and which one's not right, there'd be no more debate about it because everyone would kind of learn that system and then edge out the ones that are wrong and go with the one that's right. We just don't know. And that's, you know, that's why they say, well, it's a matter of faith, I suppose. But it's just harder and harder to believe as I get older. And it's not about intellectual arrogance or thinking that religious people are dummy. A lot of religious people are very smart. I just can't ignore the science of it anymore. I, that's for me. That, you know, again, you may feel differently. That's cool, too. But I... I cannot ignore the science of it and I my whole life was able to but when I hear the way a lot of religious people deal with you know the, the carbon dating or with uh, you know it, it just frustrates me that they are just really not willing to admit that uh, they just keep changing what they think the Bible is saying to fit science that becomes undeniable it's but you know, that, that's just my take I, I still feel the same way because they're, they're friends of mine that wholeheartedly believe the earth is 5,000 years old and I just right. cannot wrap my head around that for a second well, and everything it's, it's else not. Yeah, there. yeah. It, anyone that thinks the Earth is five thousand years old is a child. You, you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> believing in God is one thing. You want to believe in Christ or Muhammad or whoever, but if you li- literally think the Earth is five thousand years old, I think I think you're a child, and you really have to stop it already. It's just silly. All right, thanks very much, buddy. <laughs> All right, take care. Um, wow. Let's see here. Oh wow, another question. Hi, Jeff in Kentucky. How are you? Hey, Jim. Good talking to you again, buddy. Hey, thank you. Hey, the uh, the caller that called in today and, you know, said he was Christian, it, it kind of listening to his speech and, and his, you know, kind of the, the hate speech that he was throwing out kind of made me bristle a little bit. Um, I am a Christian. Uh, I believe that, you know, Jesus was, was killed and crucified and rose from the dead. Um, but... I'm not put on this earth to judge other people. So 
So if, you know, do I believe homosexuality is a sin? I, I do. Um, I, but does that mean that I think they're going to hell? I don't know. And if, if someone does these things, I, I see homosexuality as the same thing as someone who sins in gambling or alcohol or pornography or any of these things. We all have, we're all born with vices and we're all born with something we're drawn to. And you have to, you know, put up your armor around those things and defend yourself from them. It's not a sin until you act on it. When you act on it, it becomes a choice. And that choice, I don't know what happens to these people when they die. I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and judge them for, you know, you, you love the sinner and you hate the sin, but I'm put on this earth to love one another, um, and not to be a judge. It's not our jobs to judge others. It's our jobs to live our lives in the way that, you know, Jesus did. Here's, here's, let me ask you something. This is my issue with all of it. Not Jesus or Muhammad or whatever, Jehovah, whoever. It's people believe in God. And, and again, they believe God created the universe and all this stuff. We now know the universe is 13 billion years old. We now know there are hundreds of billions of stars. That's not made yep. up. That's a fact. We also know that Andromeda is the nearest galaxy, and that's about 2 million light years. Our nearest neighbor is 2 million light years away. That's the scope of, of the size of everything. And yet, we think that the guy who created all of this is worried that one little creature who has basically the same DNA as the ape sticks the dick of the other little creature in his mouth and that guy gets mad. Like, do you understand like how unimportant on a celestial scale homosexuality is or heterosexuality? Like, for, for people to think that the omnipotent creator of 13 billion years of, of, of what we see cares about the state institution of marriage is just, it's, I'll never believe it again. But again, I'm not knocking you for what you believe, but that's where I come from with it. And again, I don't want to debate religion because you're not, you're not going to change my mind and I'll never change the mind of a religious person. But just so you know, it's not coming from a place of, hey, you guys are so stupid. I just can't marry those things in my head anymore. I cannot make that connection anymore. I can't, because this, you know, when you look at Spotlight, that's the church. These are people who covered up, and again, there's a lot of great people in the church, a lot of very loving and good and charitable people in the church. But the and that's same, what we should be. I, I totally agree. But the people who were there, Cardinal Law and that fucking scumbag Ratzenberg, I think his name was, these guys that covered up pedophilia scandals or moved mm -hmm. these fucking child rapists from place to place because the interests of the institution were more important than keeping children from having their asses fucked. The, these dirtbags... Like, do people think that, that the folks in charge of Catholicism, like, 2,000 years ago were different? They were the same people. And they were the same people in charge of Islam and every other major religion and every other major institution. People have not changed that much. So for some reason, people trust the integrity of, of, of people 2,000 years ago, or actually 1,700 years ago, to transcribe the Word of God into the Bible accurately. And yet we see what people of religion do today. It's mind-boggling to me that people can't see, oh yeah, the same self-centered shitheads were running this show back then that are running this show now. So all right, I got to go, but I, I, I don't mean to, you know, whatever you feel is what you feel. There's a lot of great people in the Catholic Church, and I, you know, obviously there's a lot of very charitable religious people. Just let me say one thing. Sure. You talk about, like, the science side of, of it, you know, and the 13 billion years and those things. Nobody... Nobody really knows, and I'm not going to sit here and say the Earth is 6,000 years old or 13 billion, however many. Nobody knows. Um, and I, I, I have I, to disagree. Kind of, so I, I have to disagree. I have to disagree and say they do know. Um, I have to disagree and say that science, the science for that type of stuff is so, is so overwhelmingly in one direction. Um, the, I think the Bible... The but Bible again, dude, dude, hold on. I don't want to debate religion with you. No, I, no, no, I know no, you no, feel, no, I, I know, but I got a lot no, of calls. No, I, got, I know I got a lot of calls. 
and I have to let you go, but it's not like, fuck you, you got to go. I just got a lot of calls, and I've already been on this topic for a while, and it's one of those things that we will always be on other sides of the fence, and as convinced as I am, I know you're being sincere, and you're, you're being very genuine, and we just will never see it each other's way, and that's cool. I, I got to run, though, okay, because I do a lot of calls. One thing, one thing. All right. The Bible says the earth was formed in seven days. Who yeah. knows what a day is to someone who created the universe? It could be a hundred billion. Well, years yeah, of ago. course. Yes, it could have been symbolic days. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, pe- people transcribed what they thought the word of God was. All right, I got to run, buddy. Okay, I appreciate your call. All right, bye. take care, man. All right, let me ask them some uh, regular questions here. Uh, R- Robbie in Oakland, what's up? Hey, Jim. Uh, Hello, big sir. Fan. Um, Thank you. I just. I was just calling um, because I was wondering if you heard about the recent stuff in the media right now trying to characterize what Trump said in the debates about Jeb's Jeb's brother not keeping us safe as a 9-11 trutherism. I I was wondering if you'd seen any of that and what you thought of that. I think that's a silly interpretation of what uh, what he was saying. I think what he was saying is basically George Bush couldn't stop something bad from happening. I think that's the beginning, middle, and end of it. I think a lot of times Trump says stuff where he's just firing out answers. Do you know what I mean? That's why he said things about McCain's military service. You know, I like people who don't get caught. You know, he says things that sometimes should be phrased a lot smarter and a lot better. But no, I do not think that Donald Trump is a 9-11 truther. And I, th- you, I, think, you, I think any characterization of him as that is unfair and inaccurate. That's my, my, my imp- uh, opinion of it. I mean, it, I guess it just seems like they're trying to tarnish him i mean not not that, well, maybe. that he's not already tarnished enough but it, it, it seems such a crazy logical leap to say yeah. that what he said yeah. is is that so yeah well, the agree. media is always do the media is biased they're shitty they're tabloid they're based on getting clicks um the idea of the news really meaning anything anymore is garbage so anything they're trying to do doesn't surprise me anymore they're trying to get interest in the story so we watch that's it all right yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, pal. Uh, let's see here. Joe and Georgia, I'll try to answer this, but I don't have any experience with it. What's up, pal? Yeah. Jimmy, how are you? I'm good. Uh, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for all your uh, uh, comedy at the, the old Punchline in Atlanta. I went to see you several times, and you just had me in stitches, so thank thanks you very so much. much. Thank you. Uh, the question I have is my uh, my current girlfriend is 19, year old, 19 years younger than I am. Nice. And she's, you're welcome. And uh, she's she's been to swingers clubs before, but not with uh, a, a regular boyfriend. And uh, I was wondering if you had any experience with going to a swingers club. Um, and uh, uh, we discuss it on a regular basis, but I haven't brought it. Actually, she's brought it up. Um, and well, are you? Would uh, you be okay watching her? I haven't done it per se. Yeah. Um, would you be okay watching her sucking another guy's dick or fucking another guy? Well, that's. You know, again, the relationship is still relatively new. We've we've been friends for about three years, but we started dating about five months ago. And so, uh, I guess you know what you're saying is, you know, how am I? How do I feel about it? And I said, well, you know, I'm really not sure if I'm there yet. Uh, well, and, uh, make sure you're there yet. Make sure you're there. That would be my suggestion because once you go, man, it's kind of hard to unsee her. If all of a sudden she unleashes. And you see her being fucking skewered between two guys. It's hard to unsee. I mean, you know, it's delightful, yeah. but it's hard to unsee. So I'll make sure you're ready. That's all. You should both be ready. Okay. Okay? Thank you. All right. Take care, my friend. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jason in Detroit. What's up, Jason? Hey, uh, hey Jimmy. Um, great, uh, great to talk to you. Um, um, I've been writing a lot of jokes for the, like the last eight years. I'm a truck driver, like most of the listeners. Oh yeah. And I, I write down a lot of jokes. And uh, real quick about the Amy Schumer thing, I've written down a, a ton of jokes in my little notebook, and I know nobody reads it. Then about a month later, I'll ask you comedians for the first time, and they'll do my jokes. So apparently they're ripping me off, and I, I it, it makes me mad. Yeah. Because there is no such thing as put a little thought. But anyway, um, <laughs> right. yeah, of course, as a truck driver, I don't have an opportunity to go on a stage. And uh, I was just curious about writing for other comedians. How do you go about doing that? Is that something that happens a lot, or is that kind of like a, a dead thing? Well, can, no, no. Comedians all use writers at times. I use them for roasts or if I have a special project. The thing is, I, I've never randomly written for other guys. 
maybe you could contact other comedians and submit a few of your jokes and say, hey, I'd love to help write for you. Are you looking for anyone? And then work out a price that's very reasonable. Um, you know what I mean? And, and see uh, that way. Because a lot of times guys, like, I don't even take submissions from people because if I ever do anything, God forbid, that's like it, and I didn't see their shit, all of a sudden they think I stole it. So I, I, I never want to hear that. So maybe you should just randomly email a few comics and just say, would you be interested in seeing a couple? Okay. Most okay, people say I, no, but that would suggest that. Because a lot of times I'll write a joke and I'll tag somebody through via Twitter just to spread, you know, I, I, once in a while I'll get a response. I got a response from you from a great joke I wrote about Andy Rooney on his last day wishing he'd do the same thing as the... Uh, Shoot, I can't remember the guy from Pennsylvania who shot himself in the head. He retreated, yeah, he retreated that joke for me, and I got a huge amount of likes and follows from it. Oh, and that good. was a great day for me. So, anyway, thanks for your uh, info, Jim. Uh, yeah, maybe you do it on Twitter, too. That's a good idea. Maybe on Twitter you could do that. All right, appreciate it, Jim. All right, thanks. buddy, be good. Yeah, that's a, that's a question I really don't know. I've never actually done that. Uh, Louie in Missouri, the trucker who was accused... Uh, scared to go home because of that 12-year-old girl's accusations. And we have an update. I'm going to take an update. Hey, Lou. Hey, Jimmy. How are you? I'm cool. I'm well. How are you? Uh, I'm a lot better after uh, after your phone call last week. Or my phone call. You, I'm sorry. Uh, Good. Uh, your advice, uh, I'm a lot better. Um, I talked to the parents, and uh, uh, they have her in treatment right now uh, because they got neck or they got to the bottom of it. Uh, she accused me of everything because I didn't buy her a milkshake uh, wow. twice th- twice that night. Wow, so she said you put one on her back. That's kind of rough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, wow, she uh, said you didn't buy her a milkshake and then lied. You know, a lot of times kids, dude, you know, kids can be very victimized. But when somebody is 12 years old, that's not six. Like, that's just a, a fucking asshole kid. I, I don't care why she did it. She knows that that's a horrible accusation. To make so good for you, man. I'm happy that you actually. Uh, I'm happy that you actually were exonerated. Good for you, buddy. Yep, and uh, I have an attorney uh, actually looking into, uh, you know, to see whether or not uh, we can actually go after the parents for anything. So, well, yeah, find out. You may not want to if the parents are doing the right thing because they actually did tell you the truth. Um, they're stuck with this fucking compulsive liar kid. So see what happens and how much damage she's actually done to you. Um, but right. maybe there's a way to work it out where she has to recant it to a lot of people or whatever, you know. But good for you. I'm happy that it worked out, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Uh, let's see here. Bob and Mass. Hello, Bob. Hello? Uh, where's Bob? Oh, Bob is not there. Recently sober and bored to tears. Uh, let's see here. Oh, my God. Dan and Philly. You bet I have. Hello? Jimbo. Hey, buddy. What's up, man? Uh, huge fan. Thank you, man. Um, I love you in the morning. I love uh, hearing you this part of the um, segment of your radio show. I like hearing all your insight on everything. But uh, okay. um, quick synopsis of me, I guess. I'm, uh, I'm five years sober. Just celebrated five years in February. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I called because I know you're sober. I think I found out a couple years ago, and I know you... Um, I'm sober through AA. I was more of a drug addict, and I just found my way okay. um, in, in AA, regardless, you know, not NA or whatever. And I know you use a uh, different fellowship, and you don't mention that, which is cool and all. But um, sure. the last couple years for me have been, you know, I've kind of lost that fire sure. um, as far as, you know, when I was first getting sober, you know, the first, like, three years or so, I was in meetings almost six days out of seven day, seven day weeks. And, uh, now, you know, my life has gotten a little bit more full. Um, I got engaged in December. I'm going to school three nights a week. So basically, I'm going to, if I'm lucky, one meeting a week. Yeah. Um, I don't go to as many as I should. Uh, I, I definitely understand that. Yes. I mean, that's why I, I figured, you know, with your life being so jet, so packed full with stuff, you know, I'm, I'm almost thinking, thinking to myself, like, who the hell am I to start complaining that, you know, that I, I don't go to enough meetings. But the thing is, like, I used to have, like, a fire for for sobriety and helping other people and praying and all that stuff. And it's all kind of uh, gone away in the last two years. And, uh, you know, it's it's very scary to me because, you know, I don't ever want to go back to the place where I was five years ago. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's also that my feelings inside, you know, like, 
I, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not to the point where, uh, you know, I'm going to get high tomorrow if I, I don't go to a meeting, but it's more of, you know, getting like fucking infuriated over little things that didn't used to bother me. You know, like I don't have that serenity as much as I used to anymore. And my patience is really, is really lacking. And, you know, my fiance is like, well, you know, I don't see it, but like to me, like I, I feel yeah, you it. Know it. I feel you know it inside me, man, and it's just, you know, I, I'm in school again for another 15 months that my work's paying for, so, you know, I can't really, um, you know, go away from that. I'm also going to the gym a lot in the morning, and, you know, I'm putting things in front of my sobriety. Yeah, yeah, that's the, Dan, that's the, that's the key there. I, I've done it, too. You know, all of a sudden we get sober and our lives get, you know, and whatever the method a person uses. But then we let all these great things we get as a result of it get in the way of continuing to do the... You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like right. if you have cancer and all you got to do is go for chemo and you can stay alive and not have cancer or not have cancer affect you anymore. And yet we constantly let these great things we get keep us away from the chemo or whatever the thing is. So right. I, I definitely go through that. And sometimes I hit walls. Years ago, somebody told me it's because it's t- you, you have to, to, to grow a little bit more, meaning I've done as much as I'm going to do at this level. It's time to do the next thing. Like without getting too specific, um, have you done a fourth and a fifth? You know what that means in sort of certain people. I do. I do. I haven't done one in a while. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it's time for one of those, or maybe it's time to work on six and seven a little bit more. You know, th- there's a lot of stuff. There's always something I'm lacking, and I do hit the wall, dude, and a lot of times I just white-knuckle through it, and I'm miserable. But yeah. giving you the answer that I know is the answer is I, it means I have to go back and do some more work. And uh, it grounds me. It centers me. It makes me feel so much better. I have so much more positive outlook. Helping somebody else always makes me feel better. So that's what it is, dude. When I get, I get so caught up in how great life is and how busy I am and what hot shit I am that I forget um, exactly where I will be if I don't. It's almost like all if – I would find if I was still getting high. I have plenty of time. It's amazing how much time I have to cruise for escorts online. Yeah. Even, when I, even when I don't get an escort, it's amazing how many hours I can spend looking. It's amazing how much time I can devote to pornography. But wow, I don't have enough time to go and do that. So you know, I bullshit myself and I give myself. I prioritize wrong. So right. you know, my only suggestion would be prioritize right again because you know what the answer is and you know what but the result Jim. of not doing it will be. Jim, you are hot shit, though. I mean, you, oh, you sir, really, I don't know. I think I'm hot. I think I'm hot shit on a silver platter, but I'm really cold piss on a paper plate. You know, all, I remember <laughs> stuff you do that chip to those cartoons, man. I fucking love all that shit. I'm seeing you in. Uh, my girlfriend got me uh, coincidental uh, for my uh, five year anniversary tickets to see you. I think the 31st in March at the Fairmount. I think it is or somewhere. Oh yeah, so. I'll be there at, in, in Philly. Yes, March 31st. Cool. I'll. Uh, I'll write, I'll take my shirt off. I'll write a jambalaya, jambalaya on it. Please do it. I'll know it's you. All right, but I got to jump. All right, thanks, pal. Thanks, Jim. Be good. Uh, Yeah, March 31st, I'll be in Philadelphia, which is, I believe, where he is from. Uh, uh, I got on after. Uh, Anonymous in New York wants to ask a question. Hello. Little Jimmy Norton. Hi, buddy. A lot of sober questions today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? You, you're, you're a power of example, and I just got to get this out of the way real quick. Saw you at Levity Live uh, in West Nyack back in uh, July. It was a 50th birthday present for, for my family. You were awesome. Thank Any you, listeners buddy. out there that hasn't seen Jimmy live, get tickets, man. He's Thank awesome. Thank you, man, very oh, much. Just, and I, I just want to tell you, because I know I only got a certain amount of time here, you are an amazing guy, and I admire your sobriety so much. Um, I'm oh, a you're very nice, but it, la- it lacks a lot of spirituality, but thank well, you. Well, you know what? Well, what you lack in spirituality, you make up in a lot of other ways, and I want you to know you help a lot of people, including yours truly. Uh, listening to you for forever, I mean, you know, on, with Opie and Anthony, and oh, now with Opie and you. And Anyway, long story short, coming up on a year, okay, uh, great. really great. Promises are coming true, working on step seven with my sponsor, and it's just, um, for anybody who's struggling out there, man, it's, it's worth, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it, worth absolutely. the work. Absolutely. Yeah, it, and it's, it's absolutely worth it because the option is to fucking get in the car and fucking plow into somebody and do eight years in jail. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, this is the easier, softer way. Absolutely. 100%. And, and I know, I know you gotta run, but whatever comes in October or whatever comes down the road, 
I know you're going to do awesome, and I'm 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 proud of you to call you uh, like a, a radio friend. Well, and I look forward to see you sometime uh, next time you're down here in, uh, in West Dyke on a lovely live or, or somewhere local. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, buddy. All right, man. Take care, brother. Yeah. And now uh, here's a guy with an obsession. Hey, Matt in South Carolina, what's going on? Jimmy, I thought uh, regular Joe was the best, but then Kirk Cinnamon takes the cake. Um, but seriously, well, sir, I take you know I, I take the cake, but I'll share it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just I'm having some fun with you. Go ahead. Um, but ser- seriously, right? Like two years sober. Um, found out last week I'm getting I'm getting my license back, and I'm in the process oh, of getting a car. Cool. You know, a big fucking deal, right? That's right. And then uh, the girl that I, I I didn't see any girls for two years. I find this, this one girl shows a little bit of interest and we go on a few dates and everything's take it slow, take it slow, take it slow. And then she bails on me on last week on the date and I am obsessing over her completely forgetting the fact that I did throw my car into a pole and I almost killed somebody. And yet I'm not looking at the good thing. I'm worrying about this stupid, this stupid girl. And I know it's stupid from the beginning, but yet I let that obsession stay there. And I know I'm powerless over it. It's just so frustrating, man. Yeah, it's a tough one with women. I get those moments, too, where if a girl cancels on me, I obsess over it. And I get so angry over it. I get oh. feelings over it. We tend to put more into these situations than we should mentally. Uh, but we're addictive people. You know, the high of a pretty girl, all of a sudden, what is she doing? Is she not interested in me? Cause we, you know, I put my self-esteem and stuff outside myself. So if I'm going out with a girl... And she's attractive when I have good self-esteem. But if she ditches me, oh, that just validates what I thought. I'm fucking shit. I'm garbage. And she was right to ditch me. So is she done with you for good? Uh, I don't know yet. She said she'd reschedule, so it's on her terms. But And that's the other thing. Like, she said she'd reschedule. So I you know, I talked to people in the program. And it's like, dude, all right, I got to let her. Like, I, I, I can't text her call. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, on, it's on her. My side of the street's clean type of thing. But sure. it's frustrating because, like, I want to know. I like because it's so. Sick. But that's the, the the stupid obsessive part is that, like, I know what I have to do. Awareness is great, but then whether or not I follow up with the correct action, that's all. It's just it's just, it's really frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, you know that it's obsessive, and you know, as they say, this too shall pass. It will go away. It'll go. It's not. You're not going to have the obsession forever. Just realize, hey, look, this is an obsession. And what do they say? Obsession. It's a thought like that. Logic has no power over. So you know it's irrational. It's like being irrationally angry when a baseball team loses. Like when right. the Yankees lose, is it rational that somebody would throw a bottle through the television? But people do. You know, so sometimes these crazy things that we put so much emotion into, we know on some level that it's absolutely idiotic, but we do it anyway. You're the best, Jim, and I'll close with this. The most dynamic shift I ever saw was in Charlotte in November when I went to the show with my brother. These idiots were cheering on for Chip, and then you ask my brother what his name is. My brother tried to flip the script, and he, he said he was regular Joe. And then you just went straight into Uncle Paul. <laughs> Good. I molested him. Good. Thanks, Straight, you know. Straighten him right out. Thanks a lot. Very much. Uh, let's see here. Stan in Georgia. Guys hitting on your wife. Hey, Stan. <clears throat> hey, Jim. And it's all your fault, too, man. I got to tell you that. Okay. Because, all right, the reason why I'm calling is to tell you that I'm a black guy, and I got one of those juicy wives that y'all be talking about on the show all the time. Okay. And my wife is in love with Chip Chiverson. I mean, uh. <laughs> Free dog on day, man. It's what's that? And all these other sands that you do, man. I can't get it. I, I mean, I can't get her off of it every single. Day. <laughs> You've it's been my life, man. I mean, it's <laughs> my, life. my trainees getting mad. They don't know what in the world she's talking about. She calls them lessons and everything. I mean, it's ruining everything with me. That makes so me I happy. Just had to I just had to tell you that just to put a smile on your face today and let you get back to work, man. Okay, thanks very much. All right, Bill. Uh-huh. Okay, take care. Um, now, is that Stan in Georgia? Oh, he said the advice on how to do it. I got hit on his wife. Okay, that was just a chip comment. Um, let's see here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Michael in Maryland, uh, stand-up question. Hey. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, Jim. Uh, uh Hey, I really like stand up and I last year was my first time doing it and I fell in love with it. It's like the only thing in my life I'm actually even right moderately to, yeah. yeah, I'm even like moderately good at. But I've come across this terrible situation now where like I don't have a job but I wanna keep doing it, but now I'm in this situation where 
I can really only do it like two times a month. And I've noticed this change like at the places I go where now it's like I'm kind of just like always like put to the back and there are times when I have to like debate with myself like, okay, do I stay and do my set or do I just leave early and then try and come back again because I'll miss my train and there have been like two times when I actually stayed and did my set and I had to like walk like three three miles home but and just wanted to know like what's the good like should I just keep going about it or what's a good way to handle it? How about getting Uber? Get an Uber app for your fucking phone this way when you go late you can just call an Uber car. Mm-hmm. Oh that's, that's the thing though I, I don't have a job so I'm going oh, to break right. Yeah. Well, I mean, dude, you can't make you put yourself in financial peril. Um, you know what I mean? So why don't you once in a while make that decision? Like, you know, what I mean? you don't you don't have to make one decision that lasts you every time. Just do it once in a while. Like, you know, hey, sometimes I'll stay late and then walk home. And uh, other times I'll actually be more responsible and go home early. Do you know what I mean? Split it down the middle. You don't have to make one decision. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, also, uh, one more thing about it. I... The, I, at my scene, um, cause I, I do, I try to go into DC a lot, but it's kind of iffy cause there was this weird thing of like, uh, like a big name came through and now it's like the whole thing is like shut down. Like, how do you approach a scene where it's like, they kind of say they're an open mic, but not really like they're more of a showcase. Do you just wait till you get somewhat of a name and then approach them again or... It's hard what? to get on in those situations. You mean like, you know, you, you're not a big enough name for them to put you on, even though it's technically supposed to be an open mic. Yeah. Yeah. You may, you may have to just switch and go somewhere else or just be willing to hang out enough and eventually you'll get on. But I mean, I, I think there's so many places to perform. You should be looking around and just uh, finding places that will put you on. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to sit around. It's a lot of waiting around, going on late, getting bumped. That's a part of it. But if it's a place that you're legitimately never going to get on, then, you know, you might want to make a uh, a decision there. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. I appreciate All right. it. Take care. Uh, so I, pardon me for yawning. It wasn't about your question. Uh, Andy in West Virginia, cheating on your wife. What's up? Hey, Jim. Um, I dated a girl a little over 10 years ago for a couple years, and now I've been married for about seven years. Six months ago, we got back in contact, and I have been having a full-fledged affair with this girl. Um, she makes me feel great, tells me all the great and wonderful things that I love and all that stuff. And my wife is a great woman. She is. There's nothing wrong with my wife. But we just, this is both of our second marriages, and it was more like a marriage of, you know, we know what we want as adults. You know, this works well. We're like yin and yang. But... I told my wife the other day that I was in love with this other girl, and of course oh, that wow. didn't. Yeah, I, it didn't go over well at all. And we're going to go to counseling tomorrow, but I just I I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm actually in love with this other girl or if I'm, you know, you talk about addiction, just addicted to someone making me feel great. If that well, let me sense. ask you. Know, part of it is like she, the other girl, probably represents freedom from responsibility, a fresh new thing that's not attached to a a forever contract you know a lot of times affairs if they become relationships sure they do work sometimes but other times you realize a big part of the high is the sneaking around or the fact that she's not the wife and then if you get with her all of a sudden you'll still need that extra high because she won't be giving you that extra high anymore so you should figure out exactly what she does for you yeah and my thing is i've always thought about what relationship actually works you know when you're having an affair and then you decide to have a relationship with this person which one actually works i mean they i've never heard of them actually working is so she something. married too yes yeah, she's married too all right so you're both looking for something outside your marriage if you were to get together what makes you think you'd be loyal to each other <laughs> that's the thing i don't know I've I've never been a really good guy to be honest with you, and I've I've tried my damnedest to be a good husband because I have a great wife. I do. Sure. I know I do. It's just you know, <laughs> someone you know. My wife is a business oriented woman. You know, sometimes our conversations just feel like a meeting, and this other girl just you know texts me all day, and we talk all day, and she's just 
great, and I don't know if I'm addicted to just feeling good like that or if it's something that's actually there. If you had cancer, if you were diagnosed with lung cancer, which one of those women would you want by your side? Damn, that's tough. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Uh, like if you're, and, and again, I'm not a married guy, but if you're a married guy, maybe you got to think like that. Which one would be better and more loyal and take care of you and go see you and and, and look out for you? Yeah. I mean, All I, right, you know, again, I'm not saying don't leave her, but I mean, just think about it and make sure that the other girl is for the right reason. Because I've gotten addicted to fucking sick situations just because they feel new and fresh and alive and not like the same old thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Jim. Thank you. Okay. I'll see you later. Good luck. Uh, let's see here. Chad in uh, Idaho. I have not. What's up, buddy? Hey, uh, Jimmy. Hey, uh, I was kind of flipping through uh, YouTube oh, last week or so, and there was a guy that uh, on YouTube, and it was really awkward. I don't know if he was just, I don't know if he had special needs or what, but he was kind of doing like Kirk Cinnamon thing, and it says, uh, like the title was like Jim Norton or something like Jim Norton's Kurt Cinnamon uh, impression. I didn't know if you saw it or not. I have not. Uh, Norton's uh, on Kirk Cinnamon. Let's see. Yeah. And he's drinking like a latte or something. He's bouncing on his bed. And it was I, like. I mean, honestly, it sounds nice. I mean, it sounds <laughs> like he's enjoying uh, something. I haven't seen it, but I will. Have to look at it. Uh, there's one guy. Is he standing up? Yeah, he's like standing up and he has like a Starbucks like latte, something. I don't know. Well, whatever. You see, that's the thing. I, I, I don't really drink lattes, so that's not even a good impersonation of me. Um, he should probably be drinking something else. Yeah, I, I see him. I'm, I'm not going to watch the video now because I'm on the air. But I see yeah, him. He, he, he looks like a psychotic. But I think it's pretty funny. Hey, look, dude, if, Kirk, if someone's doing an impression of Kirk Cinnamon, it means Kirk is catching on. Yeah, well, yeah, but it was a horrible impersonation, and uh, I'd rather watch Kirk Cinnamon all day. So. Well, sir, it's very hard to catch on. Kirk's essence is one of caring and good-natured ribbing. We all know that. Yeah. Oh, hey, Jimmy, just real quick, have you guys ever had uh, Craig Ferguson in your in your uh, in the sh at the show? Correct. No, I, I, I I've met Craig once uh, at a festival briefly. We said hello. I don't know him. Oh, okay. Funny, funny dude. I just didn't know if you were at him on the show or not. So. Yeah, no, I'd love to, but I have not. Right on. All right, dude. Have a good day. Okay, take care. Oh, no. Taylor in Boston. I hear you. What's up? Uh, hey, Jimmy. Love you. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm thinking that I might be asexual and um, in a situation now where I will be getting married to someone, and I'm not totally, you know, sexually attracted to them. Uh, what do you know about asexuals? Well, I, I know from the little I do know about it, sometimes it just comes from being abused. Um, people become like sexually anorexic or whatever. I'm, I'm thinking that's the same thing. I'm certainly not an expert on it. But do you, uh, what does turn you on? Well, I, I mean, I used, I used to have, um, I guess, a, a libido. Um, uh, but, you know, over the past few years, it's just I'm just not uh, not interested in it. Well, are you low on testosterone? I don't know if that makes you asexual. Are you getting older and you're you losing your testosterone? Well, I, it's funny you say that. I, I did have it checked and uh, had it checked a few times. Uh, I, could, I guess that's just how, how the testosterone works. And uh, it, it did come back low about half of the tests. Sure. And so, but I guess that's not enough to say that it's, Low. I guess it has to be really low before, oh, wow. before, the, before they treat you. Um, maybe it's just the doctor I went to. Well, when you had, yeah, I would ask you about that. When you have a higher sex drive, was there something that you wanted that you weren't getting? Like I always ask people that. Like, what is it you wanted that you you weren't getting? I don't know if I have an answer to that. Are you uh, gay? I mean, uh, is there any, like you know, no? Okay, so you do like women? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and I would, uh, you know, I, you know, I wish I felt something, whether it was, you know, uh, gay or straight. Um, you know, uh, it's just it's not a, a drive for me. Well, you're lucky because it's it's a drive for me. 
I think, you know, between us, there's one good person somewhere. Half of your shit and half of my shit make one decent man. You know what I mean? Because I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm looking to jerk off into somebody's gym socks, uh, which is awful. And, and, you know, you don't want to fuck anything. So the two of us are just two psychotics on the other end of the spectrum. But uh, yeah, the testosterone, I would pursue that a little bit. And then, you know, maybe you have to think about what it is that turns you on. I don't know what the cure for being asexual is if it's, a, if it's something... Um, you know, that's a, that needs to be cured even. Uh, do you, did you tell her this? Uh, no, that's, uh, that's another issue. Um, what do you mean? Well, I, I, I mean, just the, the lack of communication about it. Uh, it's, 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 it's an awkward topic. And why uh, is it awkward? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I guess it, I just feel like it, it's something that, that should be um, there in our relationship, but it's not. I don't really have a, an exact reason why it's why it's not. Yeah, it's not I good. I've say. been involved. I've been involved with someone who I was not as sexually attracted to, and I cheated on her. But again, you're not worried about cheating on this woman. No, I have no desire to do that either. So, and, and does she like to fuck all the time? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say that it's. Uh, uh, an overly, um, I, I would say it's, she's pretty normal. And well, is she, is, does she complain about your asexuality or your possible asexuality? Um, that term's not come up, but she, yeah, she's, she does question why, um, it, it's, it's not, uh, in our, in our relationship. Well, there's something, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking on Wikipedia and they're saying various asexual communities have started to form since the advent of the web. The most prolific and well-known is the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, founded in 2001. Why don't you look that up and see if you really are asexual, and A, if there is some sort of a thing you can do, or do you need to find a girl who's asexual? I mean, you know, look into it. Right. There's a lot of people. Cause there are not, and the same thing, they're saying that there are some people who consider that a sexual identity. Um, mm. and, or they're saying it could be an umbrella term used to categorize a broader spectrum of various asexual sub-identities. Very, cause sexuality is so fucking confusing. And you, I have to ask, right. of course, you, you were never molested that you know, right? No, no. Just lost um, the desire. No, yeah, no. Uh, it's like there's, like I say, there's just not a... Uh, a, a reason that I can come up with, which is what makes it so frustrating. Well, maybe you should look at different types of porn and see if any of that tickles your fancy. Like, you know, um, and if none of it does, well, then maybe you pursue it. But if all of a sudden you're watching porn and a girl fucking pees on a guy and your dick jumps through the roof, then you'll know. You got to deal with a little <laughs> fetish stuff. All right. Well, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. I'll see what I can find. Yeah, go to clitty.com, C-L-I-T-I dot com. Look up, there's every fetish you can think of and just see if any of that means anything to you. Interesting. Okay, I will check that out. Give it a shot. Hey, thank you. All right, buddy. Goodbye. Bob and Mass. And oh, Bob called before and then got dropped. Hey, Bob. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, first of all, I just want to say, you know, me talk to you for the first time. It's probably like you talking to Ozzy for the first time. You're an idol of my man. Oh, you're very nice. Thank you. Uh, listen, my question is, is I'm uh, recently sober, and I'm finding it to be extremely difficult, especially at night when it's time to go to bed. Um, I know it's been a long time for you, but um, I was wondering what exactly you do. I mean, do you, obviously, your life isn't boring, and life isn't boring in general, but when you're drinking at night and you're doing it all the time at sure. night and you do it probably to um, get sleep, to help you sleep, whatever, whatever the case may be. And then you suddenly stop. How do you, how, any advice on, on how long since you stopped? A um, few weeks. All right. Well, you dude, you have to realize you behaved a certain way for a long time. You got to give your body and your brain uh, and, and muscle memory time to adjust it will change. People don't get sober and then just never sleep again. Um, do you exercise? Uh, no, uh, but I, and I, I try, but I find exercise to be just awful. Yeah, but no one likes it, dude. No, none of us do it and go, that was a treat. 
but why don't you try it until you become used to it? Like you were doing like unhealthy stuff. If you're drinking every night and it's a problem for you and you stop, exercise really does help people sleep, but you know, sleep better. I usually do it during the day or whatever. And I think that puts you into a better balance or try a melatonin. Those are natural. Um, they only work for a day or two in a row. Um, but I think you should just give yourself some time. No, you're not going to die from lack of sleep because you're changing your lifestyle. You will eventually adjust. But just realize, be patient with yourself. You know, you, the, the old tapes have been playing for a long fucking time. So just be patient and realize that uh, it will happen. All right. Thank you very much, Jimmy. All right, good luck. All right. Uh, uh, excuse me for your audience. Sal in Long Island. Hi, Sal. Hey, listen, I, I'm uh, I'm about to do a uh, shoot for a, a reality TV show. Okay. And uh, one of the things that I had a question about was my character. Because obviously on reality TV, you want to pump it up just a little bit. The only thing is my my own my own character, my own self, you know, just, just being me, I'm already a little over the top as far as the stereotype goes. I don't want people to think about that as, as soon as they see me, think about that stereotype about Italians, you know. Well, what kind of reality everything. show is it? What's, and what I'm, is your I'm role a, in it? I'm, uh, I'm, a, um, I'm a singer, and it's, uh, cool. it's, a, it's an NBC reality show. Oh, nice. Well, dude, so, I'll, I'll just be you. Like, you know, hey, look, if you exaggerate a teeny bit, hey, we all, hey, hey, whatever. We all exaggerate a little bit. You, yeah. But, but don't, just don't make a caricature out of it. Don't, don't be a cartoon. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and be aware of it. If you catch yourself going a little far, then go, all right, let me just take it back a little bit. If, if, if it's something you're aware of, it's probably not something you're going to do to an extreme because you're going to be thinking about it. You I'm know, don't, nervous. don't obsess. Yeah. yeah, you're nervous. Don't obsess over it. You're on the show because you're a singer. They're not looking for yeah. you. I got to open a pizza joint so you can just be you. <laughs> All right, Jimmy. Thank you. All right. Good luck with the reality show. I hope you win. Right. If that's what you're Thanks, trying to pal. do. All right. Uh, well, if I, if I win, I got to go on your show. Oh, yeah. Hey, man. If you win the reality show, come on my show. All right. Take it easy. Be good. Um, Eric in Chicago. Hello. Hey, Jim. Uh, basically, I'm 30 years old. Um, I've suffered from OCD uh, since I was about 10, so 20 years now. Um, it's gotten more and more severe over the years. Um, it's to the point where it, it occupies basically every second. Um, and uh, you know, what is your familiar, OCD thing? What do you what do you do that's OCD? You know, I, I don't I don't mean to sound you know dramatic or anything, but literally everything. Um, uh, whether it's you know, in my physically, if you were to watch me, uh, you would think something was up. Um, when I'm walking, um, I, I it, it's a whole project. A lot um, of nervous you know, ticks and things like that, and stepping on this way and stepping that way. Exactly, and and I mean, I could go all day talking about symptoms. It's literally everything. It's with numbers. It's with the way I'm holding the phone right now. It's with the way I change the channel on the TV. The way I, um, you know. Uh, go to the bathroom, whatever, you know, like, uh, so it's pretty severe. Um, uh, you know, I'm a little familiar with your background. I've read your books. I remember you talking about you having some neurological things, you know, when you were younger and, uh, you know, so, um, and, uh, I've been a fan of yours for a while, so I thought I'd call in and see what you thought. Uh, the point is, um, you know, I, I've, I've gone to speak with people, um, nothing too groundbreaking, uh, that really helped. Um, all the doctors seem to always just have the same answer and that's, you know, to prescribe an SSRI. Um, I gave it a trial run. I hated it. Uh, basically I've just been kind of dealing with it my whole life without using medication. Um, I'm a very capable person. I have a good job. I have a good life. Uh, but it's just getting to a point where internally I, uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's ruining your quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. It literally encompasses my thoughts and my physical actions um, every minute. If you were to watch me closely, you'd think I was a psychopath. I mean, well, then if, let me ask you: How much worse could the medication have been? Well, I just didn't like the medication because of the side effects. You know, it, it took away my libido. It, it, it just it, it took away the edge from my personality. You know, I mean, there was a laundry list of side effects I didn't like. It made me nauseous. Uh, there was a breaking period that was pretty bad. So I've always just kind of been reluctant to try it and i i mean i haven't given it a fair crack but i don't want to be one of those people who's on antidepressants i'm not depressed um nice. i'm not suicidal anything like that so 
I've always just kind of dealt with it. And um, I wish, like, you know, talk therapy helped more than, you know, I, um, but, you know, nothing's really, it seems like, you know, I'm sort of just dealing with it my whole life. You know, there's worse things in the world for people to deal with, obviously. You know, I'm not going to die with this, but, geez, I mean, it's getting to a point where some days I think I'm psycho. (laughs) Yeah, it's a tough thing. The OCD is one of those things they just don't don't have figured out, unfortunately. Um, I would give the medication another crack because I do a little OCD shit, but it's not all encompassing in my life. From what you're describing, it's something that you really need to address. So why don't you just do that? Try the medication. And the worst that can happen is you come off it and you're OCD still. I mean, you know what I mean? And, and I don't always recommend medication at all. But the reality is, man, what you're describing seems very torturous. Yeah. Um, can I just ask you a quick question? You know, uh, okay. in one of the books you wrote years ago, you know, you talked about how uh, that story about you playing Little League and then doing the circles in the yes. field. Yep. Um, I, I've literally done that stuff. I do that every single day. So when I read that, it kind of made me laugh a little bit, except I'm not a 10 year old kid, you know, I'm a. So uh, people, um, how did you, did that just kind of fade on its own? It faded. But I also made a conscious effort to stop certain things. Like, I blink a lot. Um, Part of that is I had a very bad injury to my left eye. My left eye is a little fucked up, which is why it blinks. I got uh, hit in the face with a baseball many, many years ago. And so my left eye was damaged. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, But there's other things I do that I'm more conscious of that I can actually be aware of. Because you're not always aware when you're blinking. But if I'm going to make certain sounds that I would make, I would always be a little bit aware of it and make myself physically stop. And the urge to do them comes up and comes up and comes up. But then when you don't do them for a while, the urge subsides like smoking. So just be aware of them and say, I'm not going to spin in the circle. And there's that crazy thing where your mind goes, just spin in the circle. And there's no explanation for it, but it just feels right. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. You spin in the circle. Whew, now that's good. And it's, it's ridiculous. So intellectually, I knew it was so fucking ridiculous that I made myself stop. And it was hard. But uh, I, I was able to shed some of them like that. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully it gets better. It, it, I think it's kind of like a fear mechanism. The reason I do it um, is more because, you know, it'll say, you know, uh, drag your feet or, or rotate in a circle. And then my brain will say, no, don't do that. And then another voice will pop in and say, you better fucking do that or something that you've been worrying about is going to happen. And then I go, OK, OK, I'm just going to do it to, out of caution. Yeah, it's silly. And you know that. Try to just say, fuck doing it. Fuck caution. I'm going to take a chance and just see what happens. Okay. You, you won't fall apart, okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good luck, Ben. I have to wrap, folks. I apologize. There's still a lot of people on the phone. Um, so I'm sorry for those of you that have been on for a while. Um, I would love to talk to you next week. Um, again, just uh, we ran out of time, unfortunately. There's days where I wish I had a two-hour show. Uh, I'm sure nobody out there wishes that. Uh, thank you guys very much for your calls. And uh, again, I apologize to those of you I did not get to. I'm a little tired today. See you next week. Thanks for listening to The Jim Norton Show. Hear all that advice whenever you want to on demand at SiriusXM.com slash on demand. On, demand. on Sirius XM is real.